Mika! Greetings and salutations, friends, and a welcome back to Beasts of the Old World. Where today we are going to be talking about skin wolves. These lanky lichens are for the majority of the time completely normal men and women living their lives in human society with no one aware of the secret resting within their flesh and blood. A lot of the time, they themselves have no idea what they are, until some sort of trigger event, shall we call it? It could be something as classical as seeing a perfect full moon or hearing the howls of other wolves off in the distance, or something so extreme as the individual's life being put in danger. And when the transformation begins, it is sudden and it is violent, as it is violent, as it is no mere transformation or morphing of the human form, Rather, the monster tears its way out from inside the human host. This is where the name Skin Wolf comes from, as when the transformation is finished, standing in the place of the human will be a tall, wolf-like monster covered in the split skin and shed viscera of the human. A very nice touch to the standard werewolf stereotype there. And yes, the inspiration for the skin wolves is um, <laughs> not difficult to pinpoint. In fact, as we will get to a little bit later, the skin wolves are not themselves a unique monster or creature of the old world, rather they are a sub or side species or possibly even a mutation on the broader type of were creatures. But before we get to the broader picture, let us finish with the skin wolf first, as to add a bit of complication and intrigue to the matter, the host, the human, is not necessarily aware of the transformation. This could be due to multiple factors. Perhaps the human mind is simply not designed to understand that of the monster that the body becomes. Perhaps the skin wolf is a completely different entity that simply lives within the human body and that somehow returns to the human body after its rampages. Or maybe, most probably, in fact, the strain of the transformation, the pain of it, and the psychological trauma of the ensuing carnage is simply too much for the human mind, which will therefore, in response, compartmentalize, close itself off, and choose to forget the grisly details to protect its own sanity. Which opens up some very interesting possibilities. Oh, see, monsters like this is the reason why Warhammer and 40k as well would be the perfect setting for some actual, genuine, proper horror stories. <laughs> but if the uh, Black Library book series that tried to do that is any indication, <laughs> appearances can be uh, very deceiving. Yet at the same time, imagine this. All right, a classical story, a woodcutter. He lives in a cottage out in the woods with his family in a peaceful part of the empire, protected far away from the great dark forests somewhere along the southern edges. There might be some bandits or raiders or the occasional wild animal, but nothing like chaos. There are no chimeras crawling through the trees, no ogres, no trolls or giants looking out for a quick meal. It is as idyllic as it is possible to get within the empire. 
He has himself a family, a wife, a daughter, a pair of kind and gentle grandparents who live with them in the attic. His life goes by day by day by a drudging day. He cuts down trees, he sells wood at the market, occasionally he tries his hand at a little bit of carpentry to earn a bit more money. He makes a modest but happy living with his family. One day, he wakes up, however, with a thundering headache and no memory beyond sitting down for dinner when everything goes black as if a heavy blow had struck him on the back of the head. He remembers his face smacking into the table and then nothing. Around him is utter darkness. All the candles have been extinguished. He can only hear the howl of the wind and the rush of blood in his head. As he sees a small glint as the moon passes by the window outside. And he he's relieved. It's, it's his daughter. Oh, okay, he must have just have tripped or something, or fallen, or, or something must have happened. So he reaches out to touch her face, only to feel it cold as ice as he realizes he's staring in to the glassy dead eyes of his daughter's decapitated head. He screams, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Something has happened. The entire inside of the cabin is draped painted in blood, guts, and viscera. The man vomits at this. He cries, he grieves, but when he is done, when he has picked up the pieces, when he has buried his family, he is a big, strong man. He has an axe. He grabs it, and resolutely, he heads out the door, never looking back, axe gripped firmly in one meaty hand, and he goes out, to get revenge. He hunts down every vile creature, animal, and monster he can find. He kills dire wolves, terrorizing local communities. He hunts down were creatures. He kills evil wizards and sorcerers and a host of other things in between, haunted constantly by the nightmares of his lost family, preventing him from settling down and rebuilding everywhere else. He is driven by hatred and revenge as slowly piece by piece of his memories begin to slot into place. Until one night, lying in bed, sweating, tossing, throwing, the final piece comes to him. He can see the whole scene now. He reconstructs burying his family. He reconstructs picking up the axe, putting on his clothing, throwing a sack over his shoulder, and striding out the door as the door itself comes sharply into focus. As if he zooms out of his own body and sees himself in third person leaving as the heavy wooden door is torn and splintered by deep gouging claw marks powerful enough to bend the frame and the metal fittings outwards. There was no monster that came into his home that night, but there was a monster that tried to leave. And failed. <laughs> Too obvious? I know, I know. But hey, give me a break here. This was the best I could come up with over the course of the last five minutes. I'm sure there is some modification and refining that could be done, but you see the point, don't you? Where creatures have always been a good source of horror, as it plays with the human mind and our expectations of the monstrous. If written particularly well, you could even add in the struggle against the inevitable and the futile. I remember reading Bram Stoker's Dracula when I was pretty damn young. It was given to me by my grandmother, who couldn't read English. I could, and so she'd just seen it in shelves and it had a pretty picture on the front of you, so she figured, oh, my grandchild will love this, not having the faintest clue what the subject matter was. 
That book damn near traumatized me because I love the style of horror in it. It wasn't that there was a monster, a vampire, Dracula, or anything like that. It wasn't his rampages or the fact that he had sharp teeth or anything like that that made it scary. It was the inevitability of it. It was the knowledge that something was terribly wrong but you couldn't stop it from happening. As there was one female individual who was visited by Dracula day after day after day, and a big part of the early book is figuring out what's happening to this woman and trying to stop it. Oh, it was quite excellent. They just don't make horror like that anymore. Though certain communities on the internet are doing a pretty good job of trying, I will say. Anywho, returning to the world of Warhammer for but a second again. Skin wolves. What are they then? Because that's the question. And this is where we can broaden it into where creatures a little bit. Because they're clearly not natural. As after Skin Wolf is done doing whatever its bestial brain wants it to do, they return to being a human again. And just like the wolf burst out of the man, the man will awaken inside of the shattered remains of the wolf. In fact, that would be a nice touch to my little uh, mini horror story. The lumberjack wakes up finding the house not just covered in the blood of his beloved family, but also tufts of fur here and there to make sure that he realized that it was a beastly monster that had raided his home. Now, you might also think that this would be a pretty dead giveaway. <laughs> I mean, if you wake up inside the body of an enormous wolf thing, you might think that something a little bit weird is going on, but the human mind will go to remarkable lengths to protect itself from trauma and Hell, not even just trauma, but from perceiving itself as a threat or the villain. The, uh, the classical old saying that everyone is the hero of their own story is a part of this. There has never been a dictator or a tyrant or hell, even a serial killer that has considered themselves evil as in they themselves. They always have some kind of excuse, some kind of justification. Either they might simply be wired differently, or they might be possessed by something, a demon or an alien or other such ridiculousness, or they will have political reasons for doing what they're doing. Oh, those people over there, they're, they're stealing all the food. We have to take care of them. Or these people, they're in charge of all of the money. We have to take care of them. And so and so on. You're not killing them just because you're evil. You've got a reason. No matter how bad it might seem in retrospect. And so, it would not surprise me at all to see the human brain run some pretty damn interesting laps around itself, trying to figure out a reason why it is totally not the monster that every shred of evidence is pointing towards them being. But this is not a universal either. Not all are unaware of their alter ego. In fact, some don't even view it as an alter ego at all. Some can control their transformations and simply become the thing. It is a change in their bodies, but not in their minds. At the very least, not a complete transformation. This is more common in those societies that already accept the, uh, the terrifying. The Norskans, for example, have a long tradition of not only accepting various were-creatures, but in fact, to an extent, almost worshipping and venerating them, as they, of course, view these creatures as, well, somewhat similar to chaos mutations, though I hasten to add there is no evidence to suggest that were-creatures are creatures of chaos, at the very least not inherently. I'm sure it doesn't hurt, 
but it seems to be far too stable a mutation to be directly linked to chaos. Furthermore, many were creatures are not in fact evil. There are those that are capable of controlling their transformations, and even some that are not outright violent at all. Some simply view it as a strange and mysterious part of themselves, where they turn into a wild creature, being no more malicious than, well, your average wolf or wild dog. Dangerous, sure, but not actively hostile, unless driven to the absolute limits of starvation, or presented with a particularly irresistible opportunity. But I'm <laughs> rambling, as I so often do. Let's narrow it down a little bit and we'll go through some of the steps here. Let's begin with the idea of the were creature. Because I mentioned this, that skin wolves are not the only ones. If anything, skin wolves are merely some of the most famous ones because of how, oh, god damn, creepy they are. And I do love the design. I really hate the variant made in Total War Warhammer, mind you, because that is far more just lycanthrope, just werewolf, and that's not the fun part of the skin wolf. It's not a, a hulking, big, brutish, werewolfy hulk, like, uh, you know, the vampire version or anything like that. Rather, a great deal of the horror of it is the fact that it looks almost, almost a little Wendigo. You know, a starved, lanky, long, thin limbs, long, thin claws, starved looking. Mm, I like that. I like that way more than the more just, oh, I'm big brutish wolf thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boring, creepy werewolf. Much better. But this does also mean that they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. And to be a little bit more fair to the Total War Warhammer adaptation, they tend to focus more on the, the Norskin ones, obviously, and up there, the Skin Wolves are more, well again, valued, venerated outright. They're, they're seen as champions of the Dark Gods, and so having them be created not from normal, lanky looking peasants or forest workers, but instead massive muscular chaos warriors would probably result in a more muscular creature. But then again, at the same time, as I mentioned previously, the skin wolves are not a transformation of a human host. It is a replacement of the human host. They burst out from inside of the human rather than merely a um, a change. Though interestingly, there are some descriptions, uh, for example, in the Warhammer Fantasy RPG Beast Theory, that suggests again more of a morphing effect. Uh, one tribe of Chaos Warriors in particular, or Chaos Warriors Norskins to be precise, the um, uh, their Bearlingus? Bearson. Bearsonlingus, I think they were. Which means poorly translated into um, the sons of bears, basically. Very, very rough. They can transform into were bears and a variety of other creatures, again, kind of like the skin wolves, but far larger and more muscular. And one of these accounts comes from uh, Sorgrim Olaf's son, who is able to transform into a monster entirely of his own volition. And he first did this in combat when he noticed that his, his mouth and his face had transformed and grown. There was no suggestion whatsoever that his mind had been replaced or that the creature had burst out from inside of him. Instead, it sounded a great deal like he simply morphed into this monster instead. This might hint at different types of were creatures. Perhaps the were creatures are not a monolithic entity. Perhaps some of them are genuinely creatures of chaos, like the Norskins tend to believe. They view it as a blessing from their gods and means that they are special. Some were creatures might also not be were creatures 
at all. They might simply be Chaos Champions who had climbed the slippery ladder, slipped on a step, and become a spawn of Chaos. Not all Chaos spawns are the same, not all of them are writhing, writhing tentacular blobs of stabbing arms and wildly spawning eyes. Some of them are simply monstrous animals, essentially. It would be small wonder if one of them ended up looking quite feral and, well, where e There were a lot of other mentions as well back in the day where there were all kinds of were creatures, not just wolves or bears, but, um, but cats. And presumably, if we're going to stretch it that far, we've got a whole wide variety of potential were animals. Were ducks? Were platypuses? Actually, the last one would have been pretty, pretty damn frightening. And some of the uh, earlier iterations also had them not so much as werewolves or beasts, but more like feral warrior creatures. A bit on the fluffy wuffy side, if you get my drift. Uh, others can even appear downright simian or beastman y in nature. But then you have the civilized were creatures, the civilized skin wolves. Again, we have an example from the Warhammer Fantasy RPG bestiary, where a woman just finds herself outside one night going, Wow, isn't that moon awfully pretty? And before she knows it, she's howling at the moon with a very weird and different voice shall we say. She doesn't lose control, she doesn't forget her memories, and she is fully aware of what's happening to her. She can't explain it, she has no you know, frame of reference or understanding of it, but she knows she will turn into this creature now under certain set circumstances. This doesn't make her evil or, again, change her in any way, but obviously the Empire is not going to view it like that. And to be fair, a were creature is going to be an obvious and significant danger to any society. The person can reassure you that, oh, no, 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 Mr. Witch Hunter. Yes, I turn into a massive horrific creatures every time there's a full moon, but I can just control myself. Would you be willing to bet on that? I sure as hell would not. But with all of these um, different examples, can we figure out what the were creatures are? Well, that's a difficult one. Because we know that they can affect anyone from any walk of life. It can affect a Norsecan warrior. In fact, it seems to be far more frequent the further north you get, which suggests that whilst it might not be overtly chaotic, it is magical at least to an extent. Unless the Lizardmen or the High Elves would like to prove me wrong on this, with their knowledge of the world pretty much before the collapse of the northern and southern gateways, it seems to have something to do with magic. Alternatively, to be fair, they could also be a specific substrain of human created by the old ones, though we're entering into really, really deep speculation territory here. Personally, I would say that I favor the natural theory far more so than the chaotic theory. Are they some sort of mutation? Perhaps. Where exactly does the line go? Who knows? Could it be possible to gain shape-shifting powers through a chaos mutation or gift? Maybe. But it seems to be far too stable a mutation that occurs far too frequently. And interestingly enough, because you might explain this with the fact that chaos is what people believe it is, and that might provide an adequate explanation for why they are more common far up north. The Norskans believe that this is a special gift of their people, like the Bearson Lingus, and therefore they have a higher quantity of skin changes. Maybe, but at the same time, they have no particular vulnerability against the traditional weapons against the werewolf, like silver or holy symbols. 
And since this is a commonly held view within the Empire, surely, if they were truly chaotic creatures, they would be bound by again the same rules of chaos, and bound therefore by the expectations of humanity, and yet it doesn't appear to be the case. Furthermore, it doesn't have to be chaos. Even if we assume that the where creatures are not simply a natural mutation or their own species, but are indeed some sort of magical creature, they could be from another god entirely. The chaos gods are not the only deities, they are just the most powerful, albeit admittedly by far. Ursun, for example, is one, and I wouldn't put it past him to create a species of bear people. Perhaps there are even multiple different types of creatures that we simply in our ignorance all brand were creatures. Perhaps the bear warriors of the Beresan Lingas are completely different from the skin wolves, and they have absolutely nothing in common beyond that they are both bestial things that inhabit or take over the human body to some extent. This theory is lent further credence by the fact that we know that there are magical spells that can transform humans into monsters, and we also know that monsters can be bound by magic as well. It is possible, even, that the were-creatures themselves are neither a stable mutation, nor a creature of chaos, or any natural magical animal, but simply a experiment thousands of thousands of years ago that changed the DNA of a sufficiently large group of people that it was able to spread and take host in various host bodies that then became either stronger, more dominant, as in the case of the Beresun Lingus, or weaker and less dominant, less overt, requiring stronger stimuli to awaken, as we see in a lot of the southern lands. Might have been a magical experiment gone wrong. We are unlikely to ever get a proper, definitive answer to these questions, but is that so bad? Is a little bit of mystery really a negative? Hmm. Considering the explanations GW often furnish us with, I think I'd almost prefer to not know. But naturally, the next question follows on from what are they to what are they doing? Well, those in the south are primarily hiding and praying that the witch hunters and various Templar organizations don't find them and turn them into particularly exciting and exotic carpets, or wall mounts, depending upon your taste. That is, if the aware creature is intelligent enough to even realize what's going on. And many down south lose their senses entirely as the human mind, brought up from a very young age in the Empire, Bretonia, or the civilized lands, to loathe monsters, will simply snap, leaving nothing but a bloodthirsty wolf thing in its stead. In these cases, the monsters will terrorize nearby settlements and create little legends for themselves until somebody puts them down. Those that have enough wherewithal to realize what they are and how they're going to be treated will try to live lives as normally as possible so as to not draw any suspicion. If anything, somebody living isolated out in the woods is um, more likely to get a visit from the witch hunters than anybody else considering the society of the Warhammer world. Those in the north, however, can live openly and proudly. They are chosen, they are touched by the gods, they are special. And many of them are used as elite shock troops in Norsken raiding forces or even full-on chaos warbands. Some of them even become, in fact, 
most of them probably, become extraordinarily prominent members of their societies, their villages, their warbands and their groups. They become leaders, shamans or experts on the matters of the gods. Those that do still lose themselves to the beast are not hunted, instead they are curtailed, gathered or convinced by a shaman rituals or sharp pointed sticks, whichever one works, to gather with the rest of their kind in dens and areas where the locals can feed them by sacrificing goats, husbandry animals, local passerbys. <laughs> You know, general stuff like that, and maybe even convince them to come out and fight for them as well, to be a part of raiding armies where they will be deployed, much like particularly savage dogs, but treated with a great deal more respect than your average hound. There might even be those who have enough of their remaining memory but now prefer to fight in their beast forms that create uniforms for themselves, weapons, armor possibly even, to better garb themselves and protect their beast as they rampage across the battlefield. And with that, I think I've touched upon most elements of the skin wolves and we've also delved quite deeply into were creatures. So, until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.